Good afternoon and welcome to Hand Wavy Chemistry. In some of my previous videos, I have mentioned molecular orbital theory and used it as a way to explain and describe observations and phenomena that couldn't be accounted for using other simpler bonding models. Recently, I was asked if I could make another molecular orbital video, this time focusing on molecules with three atoms in them. But before I get to that, I want to go over the basics of what molecular orbital theory is and how we can use it. Molecular orbital theory assumes that the molecule's orbitals can be determined by adding together the individual atomic orbitals that go into making it up. The simplest example involves hydrogen, H2. Each hydrogen atom has only one valence orbital, a 1s orbital, each of which contains only one electron. When we bring them together, they can come together in phase and have a positive bonding interaction, or they can come together out of phase and have a negative antibonding interaction. Once we've combined those two individual atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals, we put our electrons in, and we end up with two electrons down in the bonding orbital. We predict a bond order of one and that this molecule should be stable. However, a theory and a model is only as good as its assumptions. If the assumptions that go into molecular orbital theory and any calculations around it are sound, then we will get good predictions. If our assumptions are poor or our calculations need more refinement, then we're going to start to see deviation from our predicted results and our observed results. So please keep that in mind as we go forward to more complicated examples. The simplest complication we can add is just to go to the next row of the periodic table. Now we have a 2s orbital and three 2p orbitals that can all get involved in bonding. One of the complications here is that we have a p orbital that lies in the line directly between the two atoms. It's going to overlap the 2s orbital. And depending on the strength of that overlap, it is more or less okay to ignore the interaction of the p orbitals with those s orbitals. And experimentally, we kind of find that as you go up to nitrogen, you cannot ignore the p and the s interaction. But once you move over to oxygen, now it's okay to ignore it. And the order of which the different molecular orbitals form changes. But what happens when we no longer have the same atom on each side? We have a heterodinuclear molecule. For example, carbon monoxide. Well, in this case, the energy levels of the p orbitals and the s orbital in the carbon are not going to be exactly the same as the energy levels of the p orbitals and the s orbital in oxygen. However, there's no way to just memorize and know exactly where everything is going to line up. For that, there needs to be some calculations, but we're not interested in doing that at the moment. We're going to use the relative positions that have been calculated by other chemists, and then just think about how things add together. The 2s orbital of the carbon and the oxygen come together. If they have a positive interaction, we're going to get a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital. For our p orbitals, as we mix the carbon and the oxygen together, we will generate two pi type bonding orbitals and two pi star antibonding orbitals, and another sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital. 
Now that we have our molecular orbitals, it's time to put in our electrons. If we start from the bottom, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That is all of our electrons accounted for. To calculate the bond order, we add up the number of bonding orbitals, of which there are four, and we subtract the number of antibonding orbitals, of which there is one. So the bond order is three. Molecular orbital theory predicts that carbon monoxide has a triple bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Now, let's add in another atom and go to carbon dioxide. For atomic orbitals to add together and make a molecular orbital, they need to be close enough and have the correct symmetry. So one way that we can approach the question of what is the molecular orbital diagram for carbon dioxide is to think about we've got two oxygen atoms that are separated, they're too far to mix together, and in the middle we have a carbon atom which is going to be mixing with each of these oxygen atoms and we will add them all together. So for our central carbon atom, we're going to have its 2s orbital and its 3 2p orbitals. For those outer oxygen atoms, each one has a 2s orbital and each one of them has 3 2p orbitals. For this example, we're going to keep the 2s orbitals of the oxygen separate. We're going to have them as non-bonding. So our first bonding interaction is going to be between the carbon atoms 2s orbital and the 2p orbitals of the oxygen that point directly towards it. This will generate a sigma type bond. It is cylindrically symmetrical. And if we have that interaction out of phase, well then it will generate a sigma star antibonding interaction. Next, we can consider the carbon p orbital that lies along the axis of the molecule, and that will also be able to have a sigma and sigma star type bonding interaction with the oxygen atoms. The final set of interactions we need to consider are those from orbitals that are perpendicular to the axis of the molecule. These will generate pi-type bonding interactions and antibonding interactions. At this point, we have two more p-type orbitals from the oxygen, which are going to simply go into non-bonding interactions. If we look now at this final molecular orbital diagram, we see that we have four bonding orbitals, and we also have four non-bonding orbitals. These non-bonding orbitals contain the lone pairs for the oxygen. And those four bonding orbitals are what we would expect, as we would predict that each oxygen has a double bond to the carbon. So in total, carbon dioxide should have four bonds. If we move out of everything being linear in a nice plane, then we have to think even harder about symmetry and what makes sense. For example, water, H2O. Hydrogen only has that one s orbital that we're going to be mixing with oxygen. So there will be some interactions that are just not possible because of symmetry. Once again, we're going to think about a central atom mixing with two outer atoms. When you look at the molecular orbital diagram for water, you may see the s orbitals for the hydrogen be either degenerate or slightly different in energy. The reason for this is that the two hydrogen orbitals could be in phase or out of phase. If they're in phase, that will be a slightly lower energy state than being out of phase. So now let's start adding our orbitals together. But this time we're not going to ignore the interaction of the oxygen's p orbitals with the hydrogen's s orbital. Because, well, it only has that s orbital. So it'd be disingenuous to ignore it. The oxygen's 
2s orbital and its pz orbital are able to mix with the in-phase version of the hydrogen atoms, generating three orbitals. Meanwhile, the 2py orbital is able to mix with the out-of-phase version, generating two orbitals. Finally, the px orbital cannot mix with the hydrogen orbitals because there is no way for the symmetry to line up correctly. So that will have to just carry over as a non-bonding orbital. Now let's put in our electrons. We have eight to go in, so we fill from the bottom towards the top, so our final two go into that non-bonding orbital we just talked about. Here we see a deviation from what molecular orbital theory predicts and what a lot of students are told and taught during valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. We can clearly see electrons in a non-bonding orbital. And experimentally, we can see that that is a lone pair. However, for the other three orbitals, we see broad peaks. It's not really clear how much each of these orbitals are individually responsible for the bond and how many would be responsible for the other lone pair that we've been told to predict. And certainly, if we look at the geometry of these orbitals, what we don't end up with is something like this bunny ear type lone pairs that we're shown and taught about during our valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So we start to see some deviation between what a simple model might predict and what molecular orbital theory predicts. Keep in mind that molecular orbital theory is only the better model if the initial assumptions and the calculations that were carried out were valid and good. Otherwise, it's going to predict something that differs from reality. Finally, let's go up to a molecule that contains five atoms. Methane, a central carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms. Our approach is going to be the same. We're going to think about it as being that central atom adding to the orbitals from the outer atoms. Just as with water, the s orbitals from the hydrogen atoms could be shown as non-degenerate because there will be a version where all four orbitals are in the same phase and then three other versions where two of the orbitals are in one phase and two of them are in a different phase. But regardless of whether or not you show them as degenerate or slightly separated in energy, the result will still end up being the same. The 2s orbital from the carbon can mix with the four hydrogen atoms all in the same phase to give a bonding interaction and an antibonding interaction. However, it cannot mix with the other three orbitals because there are differences in the symmetry, so therefore they cannot be mixed together. Those three orbitals where we have two atoms in one phase and two in another, they're going to mix with the p orbitals. And in doing so, we will generate three bonding orbitals and three antibonding orbitals. We now put in our eight electrons, filling from the bottom towards the top. And once we have put in all of those electrons, we can look and see that we have four full bonding orbitals and no electrons anywhere else. So molecular orbital theory is predicting that there are four bonds in methane, which is what we would expect from other simpler theories like Lewis dot structures. As I have mentioned numerous times throughout this video, molecular orbital theory is not the only type of bonding theory. There is also valence bond theory, which a lot of chemists find far more intuitive as it keeps the electrons localized within the bonds. 
And even within molecular orbital theory, there are different ways to calculate and add the orbitals together. For example, there's Hartree-Fock, and there's density functional theory. But that is a story for another day. I hope you have enjoyed this video, and if you have, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And if there is a topic you'd like to see covered in a future video, please put it down in the comment section below. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.